Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dump and Change. Today, our guest on is Brian Adolski, our head coach here at St. Cloud State University. Brian, how are you doing today? Doing great. Glad to have you. Um, so let's take it back to your childhood years. You grew up in Warren, Michigan. What were you like as a kid and kind of how did you get into hockey? Uh, well, I always kind of thought of myself as the golden child, as the oldest, so I thought I was a pretty good kid. Uh, Hockey-wise, um, went to go see uh, uh, my father's uh, friend from work. Uh, his son played high school hockey. So just went to a game, and uh, I liked it, and I thought it was kind of cool. And Dad asked me if I wanted to play, and so I just got into skating, and uh, um, uh, it kind of went from there. So played on a little uh, spring league team after I uh, jumped on the ice a couple times and uh, was fortunate enough to, to continue to play at some higher levels. Ended up having some fun then, I guess, huh? Yeah, it was cool. I, I still, like, honestly can remember, even though I was five, um, just that feeling and what that was like, uh, skating around and falling on the ice, and I spent more time on the ice than actually skating. But um, I just fell in love with it. thought it was really cool. Okay. Either way... Whatever your past was, you ended up at Wisconsin Stevens Point, um, and you won some national titles there. Talk to us a bit about that kind of experience and what kind of a player you were there. Ooh, uh, so one of the reasons I chose uh, Wisconsin Stevens Point was I, I had a little bit taste of winning as a kid. So won a couple state titles when I was younger. Uh, junior team uh, North American League uh, won. Uh, you know, the league and played the national tournament there. So uh, that was something that background wise, why you play the game and something that I wanted to strive for in college. So Wisconsin Stevens Point Division Three had a uh, winning history, had won three national championships straight. So that was something I wanted to be a part of and why I chose to play there. Um, we were national runners up my freshman year, one at sophomore year, and then two quarterfinals, uh, junior, senior year. So overall good experience and, uh, enjoyed playing type of player. Um, I was a forward when I was younger, converted to D, uh, probably around midget junior, um, just cause I saw the ice pretty well and I moved the puck well. Um, but as a forward kind of ham and egg, uh, up and down. So there wasn't much of a future there. So. <laughs> Um, solid, good penalty killer, block shots, uh, tough to play against. We saw you had quite a few penalty minutes. <laughs> Were you a fighter? I think coming out of college, I thought I was tough. Uh, you move up the ladder, you start to realize, uh, there's another level to that. Yeah. Uh, that and going into minor professional hockey, you kind of thought that there was an honor or code. I think my first two fights professionally, I, I had been punched in the face three times before I knew I was in a fight and uh, didn't even drop my gloves. So it took me a little bit to kind of catch on that uh, um, you need to be a little quicker to identify who was who and what was going on. That uh, So, yeah, I got into maybe three or four fights a year, but I by no means was a heavyweight. Okay. And when did you decide that coaching was going to be in your future? Uh, this is one I get a fair amount. Honestly, at a pretty young age, um, maybe Bantam age, people started to identify or tell me um, that I would make a good coach. So it was always kind of back of my head that I wanted to be involved with the game and um, – you know, I think everyone when they're younger kind of envisions themselves, you know, playing at the highest level possible. But, you know, by the time I was in junior hockey, I had a pretty good idea that uh, I wasn't going to the show. Um, so I started to think about some of those things and opportunities that may come up in the future. So I guess it was always kind of in the back of my head that I might be decent uh, at that. And I, as I progressed through, uh, college and uh, professional hockey that continued to, you know, be the case where people thought I had a pretty good head for the game. Was there a particular, like, coach that was kind of influential 
um, in your life that you think led you more towards that? Um, well, for sure, Bruce Garber, who gave me my first job, uh, I was in uh, Columbus, Georgia, in the Central Hockey League. Uh, we had won a championship there. Um, really thought that I would be good at it, and so Bruce gave me his first, uh, my first job. So you have to understand, when you're playing professional, the different leagues had different uh, rules. So the first league I played in, uh, the United League, had a rookie league. Uh, rule. So you had you had to have three rookies, but the rest could be veterans. The Central League had the opposite, where we could have three vets, um, but then everyone else had to be under like 350, 400 games. So I had eclipsed that. Well, you didn't keep a uh, puck-moving defensive defenseman as one of your veterans you keep a goal score so I was going to have to switch leagues if I was going to continue to play um, but uh, they asked me to stay in Columbus uh, Bruce uh, gave me the opportunity to get into coaching and learn and so uh, that's really how I got in so I would say he's probably uh, um, one of those influential people who kind of steered me in that direction. So do you think that coaching is when you learn most of what you know Yes and no. I mean, you have to study. The game evolves. The game's changed, obviously, uh, since I played a great deal. Um, but being a player who wasn't gifted enough to rely on just my athleticism or my skating or my shot, I had to think the game. Yeah. So at an earlier age, uh, I, I had an understanding of structure, concepts, systems, and I, I felt like I could pick some of that stuff up uh, quickly. And so that's probably part of my success is I had to think hockey. You yeah. Know, I couldn't just uh, skate my way out of trouble or physically uh, dominate people because um, I was a pretty scrawny kid. So I, I had to think. So I always had a decent thought process when it came to the game. So that's kind of what gave you the edge above everyone else, would you say? A uh, little bit, but I would also, like, just, you know, I've got a pretty good drive or passion for the game as well. So I think that's a big part of it, too, because being intelligent or being able to um, understand concepts, structures, and see the game as one thing. But if you don't have a drive or passion or work ethic, that's not going anywhere. Yeah. Was there a particular turning point in your coaching career that you thought, um, this is kind of like where I want to be, um, what I want to be doing? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Because I always wanted to be involved in the game. Like, it's so much fun still to be on the ice and shoot pucks and yap and uh, just be in that kind of locker room environment where, yeah. and camaraderie and friendships. And so, um, I guess the better question is when was it like women's hockey? Because, you know, yeah. I go from uh, coaching. Uh, pro men and people I played with to going back to Stevens Point and uh, finishing my degree and working with the men's team. Mm -hmm. Like that was an adjustment. Um, but then the next year I start coaching basically an expansion or a startup women's team at Stevens Point and I was not sure how that was going to go. It was the second year the program was in existence and, and seriously – this is how far women's hockey's grown. They couldn't do a flow drill because they couldn't make four passes in a row. So it was like hockey school and stationary passing and a goaltender at one end. And like I was just coaching pro two yeah. years before. It was not something I was super giddy about yeah. doing. Uh, I had a junior job that fell through for me, so I, I didn't have a job. I said I would do it for a year. Well, uh, that didn't necessarily happen. I'm on year like 24 or 5 now. So, <laughs> Yep. And you've been in a lot of situations like that, coming to a less successful program and 
completely turning it around like you've done here? Mm. How do you do it? Yeah, no one's given me the keys to a portion, uh, you know, as far as a hockey team goes. Maybe China was the closest. Um, you know, we had a lot of resources. Uh, there was a fair amount of talent. Uh, culturally, um, it wasn't necessarily great internally, but um, we did, uh, we, we were one of the richer teams uh, competing in the league that we played in. And so um, that was uh, fun. But yeah, for the most part, it's been rebuilds. So, um, yeah, I don't necessarily know why. It might just be growing up as a Detroit kid in the era I did, uh, having a chip on our shoulder and embracing that kind of underdog role has been something I've been pretty good at. So you like that challenge? Well, I like winning. So that's part yeah. of that. <laughs> like, that's why we play. Yeah. I never understood the whole um funsy component of uh it, it's just a game like they keep score for a reason yeah right so you're measuring yourself uh, as a person in your team and that's how we're measured so um it's kind of important to say it's not i think is disingenuous so going into a program like that what do you think would be like the first thing that you focus on when you get there is it like a culture thing um, is it like a team camaraderie thing? Um, yeah, it's evolved over time. Cause yes, I take over Stevens point second year program history. That was kind of a blank slate. Yeah. That, that was, wasn't that difficult. And then I, uh, go into North Dakota and yeah, they were only five years in existence, but that was long enough to have some, um, bad habits and, Joe culturally and so that was almost more difficult changing the perceptions of what North Dakota hockey was on the women's side and what it looked like and so and with the different recruiting rules like you weren't able to plug a hole like it, it took a long time to turn some of those things around um Culver that was relatively uh, easy just uh being at a that level structure wise and compete wise it, it's easy to to get a club in the right direction i think a coach can have a big influence at the younger age brackets like yeah. that um and then like i said uh, there were some resources there in china to be able to turn some of that around it didn't take long coming here i had accrued the knowledge enough that communication was really big and then vision and so and internal leadership, and you guys know those are the things we've probably focused yeah. on and talked about a fair amount. What do you mean by, like, resources when you were back in Team China? Oh, we were paying people ridiculous amounts of money for women's hockey at the time. So as much as uh, God bless the P at WHL, and uh, I love what they're doing and having a pro league in yeah. um, North America is huge, um, but mm -hmm. they were paying kids 75000 dollars to play that's crazy and so that's as much if not more than what a lot of players are making in the league here oh, yeah. so um yeah I, I thought our players were treated very well uh, overseas and uh were paid well were treated well staying in five star hotels and just our travel and um yeah it was a very professional organization and so that made it a lot of fun so coaching has taken you to a lot of different places. Is yeah. that one of your top experiences? Coaching over in China and Russia and all over? I would say yes, because even at a young age, the thing that kind of hooked me as far as hockey was uh, the travel. Mm -hmm. Like being uh, growing up in Detroit, you go up and, and play in Toronto at least once a month. Yeah. Um, and so playing little stick hockey and, the halls and traveling I thought was awesome I always enjoyed that so um to be able to go overseas and uh, be in China and see Beijing and the Great Wall and uh, all the history and uh, then going to Russia and St. Petersburg is a gorgeous city and the Winter Palace and 
yeah, it was, it was awesome. So I, I super enjoyed it, and it was a great experience. Did they speak English, most of the people there, or how did you? How I think you when coach? you travel internationally, and I would encourage everybody to have some of those experiences, you start to realize how spoiled we are. Yeah, everyone speaks some level of English. Everyone has some background in English. The amount of people you meet who pick up the language because of popular culture and music or like cartoons. Um, I was kind of blown away by that. So uh, speaking, getting around was, wasn't very difficult, especially in major cities. You start getting out in the smaller towns and, uh, we played in, uh, a couple smaller ones, uh, when Krasnoyarsk now, which is in Siberia, now it's a little harder, <laughs> you know, they still understand a little. Um, but, uh, it was a little diff more difficult to speak in smaller towns like that. It's interesting. So what was like, obviously the culture has got to be very different when you're over there. Was there like any challenging points that um, kind of hit you hard when you were over there? Really? People are people. I guess that's what was my biggest takeaway, even being in China uh, and then in Russia. Yeah, culturally, there's some big differences. Uh, China more so, honestly, uh, than Russia, but like they enjoy good food. They enjoy their friends and, uh, you know, a, a nice glass of wine. And yeah, I, I, I was really human nature and everything else was the same across those cultures. So, uh, there was some certain things you needed, uh, to be aware of, like I said, especially China. So, we were in southern China, uh, which was uh, our Shenzhen's basically hour, uh, hour and a half north of Hong Kong. Uh, very warm, which was great going to the rink and shorts all, all uh, season. Um, but it's good luck. You shouldn't close doors. Culturally, a closed door is poor. You want to keep your doors open and inviting which is kind of cool. Yeah. Not great for an ice rink. So you would literally be 50 feet away from the building and walk by and you could feel cold air because they just keep the doors they've got open. the doors open to the rink. So it was really hard to keep the ice yeah. at a high level. And they were just pumping all that electricity and it was just cooling down outside. And so... Little things like that were, were super interesting. Uh, I tried ordering a couple meals. As North Americans, we go out to eat. We eat a lot of food, and we were told no. Too much food. You can't oh, have it. You're put on no a diet. <laughs> I, so, yeah, I lost problem. a lot of weight over there, which was great. But, like, little things, over there. Yeah, little <laughs> things like that, they, they told us no. That's so funny. That is. Um, was your family with you at the time? Yeah, my wife uh, was with me. The boys are all older and out of the house, so it was a perfect opportunity for us to be able to do that and travel. And so uh, Nicole and I were uh, together overseas, and so to experience that, and, you know, we both had scooters in China, so we were just buzzing around town. <laughs> buzzing and around. Finding little uh, hole-in-the-wall places to eat and little mom-and-pop uh, restaurants, and so... Yeah, it, it, w it was awesome. So it was, it would have been a lot, very difficult for me to do that without that kind of support and her uh, with me. So that was cool. Yeah, she's she's at most of our games. and. Hey, yep. She's, if she's not at pickleball, she's at our games. Yes. So her uh, pickleball career now is. Uh, Taking off. It, it uh, interferes with some of our games occasionally. So, yeah. But in the off season, <laughs> then I'm going to all her pickleball events and carrying her bag and so what about you do you she get into that? that i played a little bit three years ago um you guys know how i am so <laughs> if i'm going to do it i'm going to do it for real and i'm going to play and compete i don't necessarily think that side needs to go and come out you get a little angry in that sometimes. realm so I, I just played for it was fun 
but uh, I, I didn't go all in. So, but I've already said when I retire from coaching and I have time and I devote myself to that, I, I'll be good at it. <laughs> We can't wait to see where you head with your pickleball career. Yeah, we've still got to get our I'll have to jump right into the her. senior pro uh, experience. But, uh, oh, she'll play. She uh, she enjoys it. So she'll get you going. Yeah, I heard she hands it to you most of the time. She's better than me at pickleball. Yeah. I mean, she's a college tennis player. So that she always true. beat me in tennis, a too. Bit of an advantage. The only thing uh, she used to whip up on me in uh, ping pong. But okay. when we were down in Columbus, we got a table at the rink. Well, by, by the end of the season, playing a couple hours every day, I was able to beat her. So when I got into coaching at Stevens Point, I got a ping pong table like immediately. immediately. So um, I haven't played much. While we were overseas, there was a table. So I, I beat her pretty uh, regularly and badly there which was hard for her, but now we've played a couple times and she's beat me the last few. So she feels like she's got her mojo back, which means I have to buy a ping pong table. Yeah, for you got to get yeah. dialed back in now. Yeah. I don't know where we're going to put it, but... You should uh, get one at the rink. Def yeah. Definitely need a table at the rink so I can get it back. I agree. I agree. So my forehand's pretty lame right now, which is what's killing me. But your backhand's good? Yeah. Interesting. So you obviously also spend a lot of time at the rink doing video and all the research that could ever be done in terms of the game. How do you manage your home life and family um, along with such a prominent career? Um, part of the reason hesitancy about college hockey was the answer is I don't do that very well. Gotcha. So it was a problem in North Dakota. My wife's the saint raising the boys and everything else. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, the, the work-life balance um, isn't always uh, the greatest thing for me. So um, that's what made uh, coaching professionally fun was like when you were done, you were done. That two, three months was you made a few phone calls, but you were able to turn it off. College hockey, that's not really the case because as soon as we finish, you know, recruiting then is the next layer and the, right. you're running around all summer. And so, um, yeah, no, something I've been more cognizant of and taking better care of myself. So that's why the whole cold tub sauna routine has actually been super good for me. I'm a little, believe it or not, a little more chill than... <laughs> I was maybe years ago. At the rink at the crack of dawn. Got to do what you can. Yeah. You guys only know that because uh, Sunday is there. Oh, my goodness. She's there. Sunday Cause pops in. There. She gets in about 630, and I'm, I'm there. And so we'll always chat in the morning. But uh, she's a pro's pro. She's already she dialed in. She needs to get in. a bed at the rink. Yeah. So, Live there. Yeah, I don't think that's a great idea. <laughs> She would. That's why. It's not yeah. Good. That's the well, issue. Well, you do have She's to like, go for a walk and get outside and, um, you know, do yeah. some other things a little bit. So. so back to your wife. When did you guys meet? Was that in college? We want to hear the story. Was it? So um, I'm a freshman at uh, Stevens Point. Okay. Um, and uh, there were eight of us on one floor in the dorms. So we had a great group. That's also a big reason why we're still very close uh, as a group. And so um, different uh, lifestyle compared to what uh, you guys experience as athletes. Uh, a lot of comp less competition or players, player pool. Um, culturally, it was the, you know, going to go out hard we're going to work hard and burn in the candle at both ends which I, I don't believe you can do um, nowadays um, but uh, there was a gal who was dating one of my good friends and it was Nicole's uh, sister so she used to hang out with us she was one of the few gals who would get up on Sunday mornings and 
go straight to the pub and play uh, pinball and cards with us and <laughs> hang out. And she was a great athlete in her own right. She was a basketball player, a tennis player at the Division three level, and uh, uh, just a, a great gal. So that's uh, how I met. We uh, her sister Nicole came down. They were in this uh, canoe trip uh, that we had every spring. And uh, that's where we met. So we started seeing each other after that and pretty much been together ever since that was sophomore year of college. That's so cute. Yeah. I love it. I love that I know that now. Yeah. <laughs> the competitive nature in both of you. Yeah. Yes. She may be worse than me in certain situations, really? to be honest with you. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I'll leave that one alone. I'll let you <laughs> we'll take it that back. I'll let, yeah, I'll, I'll let you ask her that because, um, yeah, I, I think there's uh, her competitive streak is sometimes a, a little bit funny to me. Competitive family. And you have three sons? Four boys. Four, four sons. And did all of them play hockey? So the older two boys, we were um, down south. So when we came back up and I retired and uh, went back to Stevens Point to finish my degree, they played for a little bit, but, like, that that had kind of ship had sailed. Yeah. So uh, the younger two, the twins played. Uh, my youngest, Mitchell, still is skating and playing. I want to say David plays a little bit of beer league. He's uh, okay. still in Grand Forks. But uh, – uh, Mitchell uh, became a kind of uh, the hockey player, won a couple state titles uh, at uh, uh, Grand Forks Central. Okay. And then played a little bit of junior hockey and played some club hockey out uh, out west. Is that something you knew, like you wanted your kids to play hockey? No, didn't, uh, didn't push them into it. Um, when you have kids, you kind of, like, they're all different. Yeah. They really are. So, like, my oldest is one of the most creative, artistic people uh, I've ever met, like, the stuff that he does. Um, he was a, a musician for a long time, and uh, I've got a bunch of his songs on my phone that I like. His early stuff I didn't think was great. Um, <laughs> Being honest. Yeah, no, because he was heavy in the rap. and it okay. was, <laughs> oh, not so, a But as he mellowed and kind of evolved, uh, yeah, he, he actually produced a lot of cool stuff. But uh, he's very artistic. Probably naturally maybe the best athlete, but that That's was never him. Yeah. Jason's my next child. Jason is and loves – sports and is super competitive unfortunately he is probably the least athletic <laughs> of the whole group so uh, that, that didn't them. well and then uh you know the twins were both uh, uh good athletes um but you know never really fully threw themselves into anything so uh david uh, played hockey then stopped and ran track and went into swimming and diving made state as a diver um, and just got into a lot of different things. Mitchell stayed with hockey and um, uh, was pretty good at that. But, um, yeah, it was an interesting journey for him because he, he didn't like it when people – people would call. You know how recruiting is. Yeah. So they're looking for something in common to kind of have a conversation. Well, most people know who I am or know of me or heard me because hockey's such a small thing and that always rubbed them the wrong way he always felt like they were calling because of me which i didn't push you into it i didn't tell anybody to call you if you play or not that's up to you it's my passion yeah. doesn't mean it's your passion like you find what you want to do and what you care about and what gets you up in the morning and throw yourself into that because i i, I knew pretty early on that hockey was my thing and this is what i wanted yeah. Was there like a complex interplay between being a coach and being a father? It's hard because, yeah, you know, I see what's going on. I see what their coaches uh, yeah. are doing. <laughs> I hear parents. And so I would just sit by myself on the glass mm -hmm. and just wanted to watch. Yeah. 
And if he wanted to know what I thought, he would ask me after the game. And I would tell him straight because you guys also know I'm pretty direct and yeah. honest. Yeah. And so there were a lot of days he didn't ask and didn't want to ask because he kind of knew. Fair. So That's we true. left it at that. Yeah. That was, um, but it was difficult because I always felt like he could have been a player. He was way more talented than I was. Um, but he always kind of wanted to do his own thing and find his own way. Well, that's awesome that you kind of, you know, just support whatever's, whatever you want to do. You got that. Uh, at know? the end of the day, that's, you know, f find your passion. Do, do what you want to do. Don't do what someone else thinks you should do or what yeah. you feel like would make someone else happy. Like, you have to find your own way. Yeah. Nice piece of advice for the listeners. Do you. Should we move on to our listener questions? <laughs> oh, yeah, listener questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the fans, they wrote in. We got a lot of questions about you. You know, they were excited to hear that you were coming on the podcast, so we asked them what they want to hear. First question, what do you think about the transfer portal? Like, what are some pros to it? What are some cons to it? Do you like it? Um, so the transfer portal kind of changes coaching a little bit where now you're kind of a GM, you're managing some assets, you're able to make your club better. Um, so those were, I don't want to say the GM aspect is a positive, but obviously putting teams together, um, in pro hockey kind of helped me with that it wasn't completely foreign coming back into it about what that looks like and, and how you're building a club uh, season to season so I, I felt like that part was kind of easy for me now that it's going away how do you think that well not the portal necessarily but everyone having Over that year. fifth year um do you think that it's going to be like not as many kids or I do I think it's going to stabilize. That fifth year made it really easy right. um, for people to transfer and continue to um, find another experience without the major of leaving in the middle of your undergrads. Right. Um, so I think it will slow some things down this next spring. Uh, I expect it to be full bore and a lot of people in there and a lot of movement again. Um, so, but that's, at the end of the day, you have to, the negative is the whole transfer portal is what you're going in for. If you're going in because you face some adversity and think that you're going to go somewhere else and not have adversity yeah. or it's yeah. going to be easy that's the wrong way to be in right now if you're going in you have your degree and you're looking for you know a graduate degree um and you want to be in a, a different experience to me that's understandable that's okay um yeah. so it'll be interesting to see how that trans inspires what that looks like in a couple of years um but obviously it's been pretty good for us and uh, our league a lot of players have transferred in the other negative i would tell you is when players get together and they're just want to go build a super team or you know a team is basically in all intents and purposes just buying players yeah. um i don't think that that's necessarily great I would have to agree. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's tough. I mean, I, th I see both sides of it. I think it's hard, but, I mean, we both benefited from it um, in one way or another. But it is kind of also hard to tell what players are going in there for, too, you know? Yeah. Like, what they're – like, they can tell you one thing about what they're looking for, but about why they're leaving, it's not always apparent, I feel like. Yeah, and sometimes that's not necessarily that player's decision sometimes, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, cause not every fifth year player is, uh, is their room cause you have to manage the roster and bring in young players. And sometimes, you know, coaching changes or 
role within the club and opportunity is not what you thought it was because people aren't always transparent and uh, just having another opportunity. But the whole going into the portal and already know where you're going mm -hmm. or like yeah. not even going through that process um, isn't what it was intended to be, but I don't know how you fix some of that. Yeah. yeah. All the behind the scenes. Yeah. We'll never know. Yeah. Okay, next question. Who is your coaching inspiration? Uh, so who coaching-wise inspires me? Um, so uh, a bit of a bookworm, especially early in my career in different phases, but like what uh, listening to reading, uh, coaches from other sports and different things, uh, probably Phil Jackson. Like those were some of the first books, uh, I ever read was like, uh, Phil Jackson's sacred hoops. And uh, I've read every other book since. So if I had to pick one, that was it. The first coaching book I ever read was Mike Krzyzewski's Leading with the Heart. Um, so th those would be two, but you guys know how I am. Like there's so many little yeah. things that I see, read, we get the videos that I the pass group. along. Yeah, so <laughs> I wouldn't tell you, I've moved from actually having a physical book to like audible and then listening to the books while I was recruiting to now like, um, you know, there's so many reels and everything else with little snippets of coaching and interviews. Yeah. And so, you know, I get a lot of that stuff. So it's a lot of different people. On travel days, are you listening to audiobooks? Not as much. It was really a recruiting thing because when I was in Grand Forks, like in the car for five hours to go yeah. really to any recruiting thing in and around the city. So there's yeah. a lot of windshield time. And so... I would knock a lot of books out with that, so. Too bad Dump and Change wasn't around. Could have just put that on. Just Never got in the podcast, to be honest with you. Like, I, I'm not a regular listener of podcasts, you know. Again, I'll get the snippet of stuff here yeah. or there, so. The important but uh, obviously, I have to pay attention to yours. Of course. And so forth, so. We might that goes without mind. saying, so <laughs> you would be the only one I'd be a regular listener to. <laughs> good to know we need your support yeah <laughs> here for you guys okay you next, the next question one? what is a funny moment that happened during a game playing coaching any god give me more of a heads up there's so many things i've been really in and around yeah, and experienced um I, I would need that to be a little more narrow focused here. obviously yeah, i'm uh cloud state the funniest thing here? Nothing funny happened. <laughs> <laughs> it no depends, funny like, what you consider funny because like, we don't have fun. <laughs> sometimes, like, you guys find things I say hilarious, but they weren't really meant that way. So, yeah. like, the funniest thing for everyone is, like, me telling someone, sleep at night not on my bench because they were slow in a line change <laughs> yeah and it's you guys thought that was hilarious except for the person that saw yeah and i'm gonna get funny. shredded yeah I, I didn't say it to be funny like i was a little disgruntled like <laughs> she wasn't on top of the line change <laughs> <laughs> not even trying to be funny what so, about avery's yes. jolly rancher story that was shocking to me, to be <laughs> honest with you. Like, I, I had some friends that, like, would eat stuff between periods, but I didn't have anyone who smuggled food with them <laughs> onto the bench. Well, if you're burglar. hiding it in your glove, like, that is, <laughs> that's, oh my God. you're smuggling. If you're putting it in your glove like that, like. Yeah, I was exposed on the podcast, our first episode, I believe it was. Yeah, that's he how didn't he found know. out. <laughs> that's how that. he found out. Yeah. Um, but actually, I think that the way that started was I read an article on the Lamaru twins, and they said, like, they'll eat a Starburst or, like, I forget what candy it was in between periods. And I was like, okay, I love candy, and I would, it works for them, so maybe it'll work for me. And so it started from that. They didn't take it on the bench with them. 
It's just if I need an extra, like, if I'm I can feeling, confirm like, that for you in case you're curious. <laughs> yeah, I was curious. There was no actually. Jolly was Ranch or Starbucks wrappers on the bench in game. It was yeah. just you, Avery. Put you on the spot. Oh, well. It's oh. all right. Fun fact. <laughs> it's good to know. Good information. For you. Okay, moving on. <laughs> um, how do you define sec success as a coach out, um, and as a team? Sorry can't read that's one of my least okay we can skip it favorite questions oh well because there's two different things um so you're always measuring the success um record wise opportunities championships like uh, i said before those things are important but uh success always is also is you guys doing well school getting your degrees being good people learning life lessons and uh, becoming you know uh, uh good wives and parents uh when you're older like th those things are part of this experience as well as helping you guys grow as people um but you know the championship thing and playing at your best and being your best and improving you know a big part of what success is i don't shy away from that but the other stuff is important as well yeah see that was a good answer absolutely Agreed. great answer <laughs> what do you like to do for fun outside of the rink fun outside of the rink <laughs> he's like what i'm never outside of that <laughs> well i mean I kind of enjoy golf, though I'm not great at it. And obviously, I don't get an opportunity to play a whole lot. Uh, enjoy when I can get together with the family. We always play a lot of board games and, and obviously are competing mm -hmm. uh, in different things. Uh, so that's fun. You know, cards, cribbage, uh, whatever it is. Um, that, that's always entertaining. So I guess I would say those things. I love a good card game. We should play sometime. I, I, always competing, like <laughs> yeah, I, that's always. that's fun. Loves to like, win. Enjoy, enjoy competing. So, you know, those are things I do. But most days, yeah, I go home and I just grab some meat and veg out for a little bit. <laughs> go to bed. Go to bed. <laughs> um, were you superstitious as a player, and are you still now? Uh, never used the word superstitious. Would say that. Is that a superstition? Um, maybe it could be. <laughs> um, so I would say no, but I am aware of patterns. I do see things that repeat, and when it's going well, you want to replicate some of that. Absolutely. How do you replicate that? Well, it depends what the pattern is and what success it's having. Like uh, seats in the locker room during kind of video. Thing. Yeah. That's a pattern of yours. I'm aware of it. <laughs> it exists. It's not a pattern when the drawers aren't closed on the cabinet and stuff like that. Like, that's a different thing. I, that's not superstitious. That's OCD. Yes. So yep. I, I am very much pattern <laughs> recognition. I like to solve puzzles. Like, And I like things where they belong. So... But I wouldn't say I'm superstitious. I don't have to do it. Okay. But I will embrace doing some things if I notice that I feel like it's contributed to us being successful. And, and that would go into who's sitting where during film. Interesting. Yeah. What type of gum do you like to chew on the bench? Lots of no-brainer. I think everyone in the world knows that uh, uh, Big Red's my gum. So that's from overseas to any stop in between i've been pretty brand loyal to uh it's a big red yeah he'll always have a pack taped on the glass that's a colin thing colin started that i like it because i always have a uh, pack in my pocket so convenient he, job, he started putting it up there so yeah i thought that was really cool good for him <laughs> way good to be job, creative colin. Colin. yeah that's uh, he'll always be known for that so that was uh that was a good thing what is the most rewarding part of coaching? 
Mm. Uh, watching you guys do well. Success. Winning. Yeah. Yeah. Like seeing uh, changes being made that maybe have been implemented and seeing them actually work out. Well, obviously, when you guys execute things we've talked about or work yeah. on, that, that's a pride thing. But right. um, yeah. you know, overall, just watching you guys uh, do well is a big part of what is enjoyable for me. Yeah. Good. Favorite rink that you've played at and favorite rink that you have coached at? Uh, favorite rink I played at, I played uh, a little bit of uh, pro roller hockey back in the day. Okay. So we played a game yeah. in Oklahoma City. Uh, I have family that's uh, in that area in Tulsa and stuff. And so they came to a game and um it was awesome there were ten thousand people there that's the biggest crowd i've ever played in so that yeah. was probably the best experience and thing as far as playing wise uh coaching wise that has to be the olympics i mean even though it was covid and uh, that experience would have been completely different with uh you know, a full barn and 20,000 screaming Chinese fans uh, while we're playing. Um, just being in that environment was very surreal, especially with everything that went down at North Dakota. That game against Denmark was pretty uh, pretty awesome just because uh, associate head coach Peter Lander was on the other bench for Denmark, and so... That was a pretty awesome thing. I got you. Um, what job would you have if you weren't coaching hockey? Um, I would joke with everyone that uh, hockey was going to work out because uh, I didn't have any other skills. Okay. So I'd be <laughs> digging a ditch. I don't know about something. that. <laughs> so that uh, the hockey thing had to work out for me because uh, – I really uh, could do. Destined for this. Uh, it's a burn the boats thing. Like you got to make it work because what, what our <laughs> options are there. So no one else is paying me to do some things like they do uh, hockey wise. So, um, and this is what I enjoy doing. Yeah. So. What do you look for when you're recruiting players aside from being a good hockey player? Well, the talent part's one thing, but uh, you guys know that that's not the be-all, end-all for me. Like, um, It's a lot more about your work ethic, your drive. You have to have a little chip on your shoulder. You have to want to put the work in. And so we'll always take a solid B kid with an A mentality and work ethic because that means more to me. How do you figure that out with It's not easy. Recruiting? It really isn't. You have to spend some time, and that's why the visits um, have been so important, and that's why, honestly, I don't love the new recruiting rules because when people would visit unofficially, you know, we would have people and their families come in two, three times unofficially. Yeah, yeah. And so we would spend a lot of time through that process, really trying to understand what drives them. And I also think having the parents involved, you know, you can say what you want about younger kids committing. I don't think in grade 11 deciding by yourself without your parents is yeah. making it a better decision. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention it's we start in June and then people are committing in August. Like, uh, I don't know about that. I, I don't think that uh, it's a better situation. Yeah. That's interesting. Have you had experiences where it's like the kid comes and you get to talk to him for once and you're like, ah, I don't think this is going to work? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. You can kind of get a sense if uh, they fit or don't fit. and You know how I am. Yeah. So, like, I'm pretty direct. And if you're fidgety and you're kind of squirming when you talk about the commitment level, the work ethic level, and I would much rather have you say, hey, that's not for me and be honest than like come in and 
pretend like you are and yeah. then be unhappy and miserable. So um, I always try to lay it on pretty thick so you're well aware of what this is going to look like. And, and if you're not on the edge of your seat and kind of smiling and yeah, and nodding your head, then, you know, you're always a little hesitant if uh, yeah. this is really for you. And I think that's the other part why the, having the parents involved help because sometimes the, when you're a younger kid, you're not entirely sure what you do really want. Mm -hmm. So that's been coming back. The hard part I have with recruiting um, is a high school kid truly knowing what it means to be great and what work goes into it and embracing wanting to do that versus the transfer portal. Right. Yeah. You've seen behind the curtain. You know what it looks like. You know what you want. You know what you're not getting, and I think that's just an easier conversation. Yeah, I could see that. Sure. Do you do a lot of behind-the-scenes work when you're recruiting, like calling their coaches, past coaches, anything like that? Is that a helpful tool? It depends who it is. Like now that I'm an older coach, there are – lot of former players who are in positions where they're working with uh, districts or province provinces and uh, so they understand the player pool but they also understand me so obviously it's easier to trust those kind of people yeah there are a lot of you know coaches that'll email or they'll tell you hey I got a kid but they have different levels of understanding i guess so it's always like well you got a player for us that's great uh, how many times have you seen us play well you haven't so how do you know where they fit in or that they fit in or how many players have you pushed on the college and how have they done and what schools have they been in yeah what leagues are they playing in and what have been their experiences you know um I'm old enough now to have watched countless players from age 14 to being three and four time Olympians. Like, so I have a little better grasp of what that looks like. A lot of other people don't, but we'll try to sell you on kids. And, you know, if you just work with them or you just like, that's not necessarily how this works. Yeah. A lot of things going on. <coughs> That we don't really talk about, I feel like. But yeah. I feel like having been in it for so long, you start to pick up on things, start to know people. and like Know who's re that. reliable and yeah. who's not. Definitely. Are there any players that are just, you'll remember forever, coaching them, even maybe playing with them? I'm sure there's a few. You've coached a lot of pretty. A lot of people that I've coached like there's different levels of being remembered yeah. and i would say it's kind of like okay that for yeah there's teacher. bad and good yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah you remember a couple <laughs> of kids who are 100 percent every day it's like what are you doing <laughs> but obviously you also remember some of the elite kids who uh, were difference makers and were special generational players yeah. and uh, i've coached a fair amount of generational players and kids who will probably go into Hockey Hall of Fames and a yeah. couple of them who already in a bunch of Hall of Fames already. And so, um, yeah, no, those are just special relationships and memories. And really, at the end of the day, that's what a lot of this is about as well as creating those memories and opportunities and friendships and relationships. So, absolutely. Like you asked earlier, that's a big part of why this is special and yeah. it's cool. Right. Yeah. Going back to our team a little bit, um, during the season, we've had some inconsistency between either weekend by weekend or Friday, Saturday. What do you think kind of contributes to that inconsistency and how do you deal with it at the time? Number one, it hasn't been that bad. No. Uh, but number before. two, we have 16 new people finding their way in our structure and our style of play not to mention the biggest thing for me is yeah it's one thing that there's this influx of new people but how much more have we added on to what we did last year or what we were able to do last year so now like you know you're 
you're challenging the whole roster to step up, be better, and execute at a higher level with more skillful things that we're able to do. So, of course, that's going to take some time, and you have to be patient with that. And, um, you know, it's the second half where you kind of, okay, here's what we do do. Here's what we're doing well. We still want to work on these couple things, and you kind of shorten up the roster. And like we talk about it in the beginning of the year, like you're earning trust. Like I have to trust you that you're going to execute for uh, the team and you're going to do what's necessary in any given moment and so you're putting that credit in the bank in practice in the first half and you're earning those opportunities so we, we have actually transitioned better faster than I thought we would so is that a worry of yours with 16 new girls coming in I mean last year you had a whole roster of new kids too yeah to but you. last yeah. year was completely house money like, we had zero expectations. Yeah. Nobody expected anything yeah. from us. So, well, it's a little different in year two. Like, okay, you're pretty good. We're not sneaking up on anybody. Everyone knows we're pretty good. So, um, it's a lot different. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, everyone else's perception of it, whether it's like they have expectations of it or not, do you think that helps or hurts kind of your mentality about it or is it something you just try not to think about it depends on the core group and to be honest with you if you know expectations drive you to work harder or if expectations make you tense up and you know to me playing with house money and zero expectations you're playing free yeah you because know. You know, nobody expects you to do anything. So it's like, yeah, well, if we do, great. If we don't, like, right. no big deal. I think it becomes harder once, like, there is a standard and there's a level and then you start to feel like you're letting people down if yeah. you don't uh, perform at that, which, again, is a mental thing. It's not the reality. Yeah. So that's why uh, expectations can be a little tricky and quite honestly why we don't talk about any of that stuff because yeah. our focus still needs to be on execution and getting better in our work ethic, those things in our attitude, the things we can control. Yeah. Last question. Last question for you. Who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> that's not it. Really? <laughs> yeah. You guys know the answer to that. Tell everyone else. The Detroit Lions are for real. They're <laughs> actually fun to watch, entertaining. I have waited my whole life for this. Get on board. You actually think they're going to win it? Like, or? I honestly think that they're probably a year away. I think there are a couple pieces defensively. Uh, D-line cornerback that they could uh, improve on. Uh, offense, I think, is legit skill player-wise. So uh, they're a fun club to watch. So I, I haven't been able to say that for most of my life. <laughs> it's an exciting time. Yeah. All I right. thought you were going to wear a Detroit Lions sweatshirt or something today. I'm, I'm sure. waiting for my Super Bowl sweatshirt. So okay. Oh, it's coming in the mail. Okay. When, I, when I get that, okay. then I'll, I'll, I'll start Great. sporting that around for <laughs> Humla. But, yeah, get on board, guys. Get on board. Especially you, Myers. You're a free agent. You don't even have an NFL team. Like, the Vikings are. No, I never enjoyed that. They're Just close. because you're next to Minnesota, like. I'm not a huge football fan. Like, I'm just starting to learn. But I do have a Detroit Lions sweatshirt. I, I don't know how. Do you why. really? It's actually really cute. I should have worn you it. You and Brian can match together. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, when they win the Super Bowl, maybe I'll yeah. hop on the bandwagon. <laughs> but till then, um, Vikings all the way. All right. Oh, <laughs> all the way where? <laughs> like, <laughs> Gosh. that's a tough one. You don't, are you sure you want to end up the show like that? 
And that's all the time we have yeah, for today. It looks <laughs> like the time is out. <laughs> Um, would you like to close this out? Yes, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. We will see you guys next time on Dump and Change.